Siri. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the invitation. So yes, I will um, talk about construction of hyperkilometrics uh, at the, the formation of complex structures. And um, so I'm not assuming anything about that you know anything about hyperkilometric manifold. Let me first define the main object of studies. So a hyperkilometric manifold is a Riemannian manifold. And there are a couple of um, different equivalent definitions. Uh, one of them is to have three um, integral complex structures. I, G, and T, which are all catered with respect to the same metric uh, G. So they are all um, parallel uh, invariant on the parallel transport. And they behave like the quaternion. So they satisfy this uh, dynamic identities. <laughs> the famous equations carved by Hamilton on the Boom Bridge in Dublin is I squared is G squared is K squared is IGK is minus one. So it's like a, a curved version of the quaternions. And um, um, so that implies that all tangent spaces can be identified with uh, powers of the quaternions. And equivalently, so that's another definition. If you have a manifold, a Riemannian manifold of dimension 4n, Four, four, then you can make such an identification, identification artificially at any point uh, in the manifold. And then so you have a tangent space uh, isomorphic to HN. So you have actions of the quaternions I, G, and K. And if you want to try to define a hypercular structure, you can try to parallel transport these operators on the whole manifold. But you have to, this has to be well defined. So if you come back, you still need to be the same operators. So that's a holonomy question. Namely, the holonomy of the Riemannian manifold has to preserve this um, union. So it has to lie in the so called compact symplectic SPN. That's a, that's a subgroup RGL and OM. So, um, in general, those are uh, quite difficult to construct, um, unlike killer uh, manifolds. So for a killer manifold, any sub, uh, complex or manifold of CN or CPN, for instance, is automatically killer, but this is in sharp contrast with uh, hypercular uh, structures because the only hypercular sub manifold of HN or just linear uh, planes, affine planes, or open subset of them, and the uh, quaternionic projective space is not even hypercalor itself, so that doesn't come. So uh, we have to look elsewhere to construct uh, hypercalor structures, and most of the interesting examples come from either the um, uh, Yao solution to the Calabi conjecture, which is a hard PD result, or some kind of moduli space in gauge theory of solution to uh, some differential equations that tells you only in that equation. Is that where they first arose? No, I, I was going to explain the first example. Um, so, um, yes, to, uh, another sense of the non triviality of this is that this uh, compact synthetic group was in a uh, so called Berger's list in 1955. So, Berger's um, classified all possible holonomy groups um, of uh, many manifolds under certain conditions. And this was one of them, uh, but it didn't show that it was possible to realize it as an actual holonomy group, uh, where it's not a containment, but an equality. So of course, there are trivial examples of hypergrid manifolds. You can take the 
quaternions themselves, the holomy group, and the three also, of course, containing the SPH. But in, for, for, to get an example where it's actually equal, um, it took more than 20 years. That's the example of uh, Alabi, 1979. And in the same paper, it defined the term Fabricator, which is on the cotangent bundle of CPM or any uh, integer M. Sometimes this is also called the Iguchi Hansen metric when N is equal to one, because it was discovered at roughly the same time by these two uh, physicists. Um, and in this case, the hypercular structure is constructed more or less explicitly. There's an explicit formula for uh, for the killer form associated with I, which defines the middle. But you can see this 20, uh, 24 year gap uh, before the first example. Um, and there's a similar story for other league groups appearing on Burgess list, such as uh, G2 and uh, spin 7. Um, but in the case of hypercular manifolds, there's a strong link with symplectic geometry, which makes it uh, easier to construct examples. Namely, um, so if you have a hypercular manifold, you know, there's an underlying holomorphic symplectic structure where you take, you fix, in fact, lots of them, but let's fix the complex structure I. And if you take the Keller form for G and you add the Keller form for K plus uh, with I, so this is a complex two form, uh, which happens to be holomorphic with respect to the complex structure I and non degenerate. And um, so it's a holomorphic symplectic structure. And it's almost uh, an equivalence. Uh, at least for compact manifolds. So there's a converse. If M is a compact, compact killer, which follows from uh, Yao's solution to the Calabi conjecture, namely the unique Ritchie flap killer metric in the killer class of the given killer metric uh, is, um, is a hyper killer metric. So the main question then is um, this, but for a non-compact holomorphic symplectic manifold. So this for non-compact cases, namely given a holomorphic symplectic manifold, is there a way to construct a compatible hypercular metric? And um, a lot of examples, um, a lot of work has been devoted to, to find, uh, such a, such metric. Uh, so for example, um, the engine bundle of uh, complex reductive groups um, have such a metric by some kind of moduli space of solution to the self dual angles equations. Um, also the quadrant orbits of complex semi-simple algebras is another example. Also generalizing the example of Calabi cotangent bundle of um, compact Hermitian symmetric spaces have been shown by Picard and Goduchon to be hypercular by uh, this explicit construction similar to the one of Calabi. And uh, another prominent example is the character variety for a complex reductive group. So that is a canonical holomorphic symplectic structure and um, is a hypercular metric coming from, from a moduli space of solution to the self dualities equation. This is the Hitchin moduli space. So for one complex structure, um, you have the character of IRT, and for another, you have a completely different very complex manifold, which is the moduli space of the expandable. That's a very interesting example. Um, but perhaps the more, the most general construction is that uh, the theorem of Fakes and Caledon. which is that if you have a killer manifold, then it's called tangent bundle, is automatically hyperkiller, um, not necessarily on the whole manifold, but at least near the zero section. 
So the cotangent bundle of a complex manifold is holomorphic symplectic, the canonical symplectic form, and it has a compatible hyperkilometric. So one of the goal of uh, this talk today is to explain uh, an attempt to generalize that where this cotangent bundle is replaced by a general holomorphic symplectic manifold. And the zero section by uh, complex Lagrangian. So we'll find that um, there's a way, if you find a deformation of homomorphic symplectic structures, which is suitably ad adapted to this complex Lagrangian, then there's a compatible hyperkiller metric. And the main motivation for that is coming from Poisson geometry. So uh, in Poisson geometry, if you have a Poisson manifold, so a smooth manifold X with um, a Lie algebra on, its space, on the space of, of smooth functions satisfying the Lagrange rule, there's a, an integration in the differentiation process uh, very much analogous to the correspondence between Lie algebras and Lie groups. Where the integration of a Poisson manifold is not a group, but a groupoid called a symplectic groupoid. So a groupoid I recall is a generalization of the notion of a group where the product of two uh, elements G and H is defined only if, uh, if and only if this the target of G, the source of H, where target and source are the two maps noted by these arrows here. So it's a, a, a groupoid with a symplectic form. So the symplectic form is the, on the, the space G here, compatible with uh, multiplication in some, uh, in some way. And there's a way to differentiate it to obtain the Poisson uh, structure from, from such a symplectic form. Um, so the identity, um, there's an identity section for each point X, in X there's a, a neutral element, giving you an embedding of X in the legal uh, point G, which is always Lagrangian. And you can do all this uh, theory in the complex category. So if you have a holomorphic symplectic, a holomorphic Poisson manifold, it integrates to a holomorphic symplectic groupoid. In general, this correspondence is not quite the same as for Lie algebras and Lie groups in the sense that not all Poisson manifolds have an integration. Most of them have one, but they all have a local integration at least. And that's, that will be sufficient for, for our talk. So it, it's a local holomorphic symplectic integrating. And the conjecture so you have an example of a holomorphic symplectic manifold and a Lagrangian submanifold. The conjecture is that if X is killer, X the holomorphic Poisson manifold, then G is hyperkiller near the identity section. So this Lagrangian submanifold embedded. And um, so it is, it's an interesting conjecture because um, well, we have lots of different examples. Uh, the Pakes and Caledon theorem is one of the special case of that. So if you take the zero Poisson structure, the Poisson bracket of any functions is zero, and the group point integrating it would be the cotangent bundle of. Um, the manifold X with the canonical symplectic structure and the identity section will be the zero section. So in that case, we do have a particular uh, structure on the neighborhood of the zero section given by the Felix and Kellogg theorem. 
And if you go to the other extreme, let's say that the Poisson structure is non-degenerate. Um, and let's suppose also further that X is compact and killer, then uh, the group rate integrating it can be taken to be the so-called bare group rate. So it's just X cross X. And now X itself is, is hyper-killer by uh, your solution to the Calabi conjecture, as I explained. And so G will be hyper-killer, uh, kind of a complete hyper-killer structure with the whole. Well, those are the two extreme cases, and there's an interesting uh, intermediate case. So one of the uh, typical example of a Poisson manifold is the dual of the Lie algebra as a linear Poisson structure. If you take, in this case, G to be complex, semi-simple Lie algebra, then the symplectic group integrating it can be taken to be the cotangent bundle of an Lie group integrating that Lie algebra. And in this case too, there's a complete hypercular metric on this cotangent bundle. Um, I'm not talking about the one coming from Fix and Caledon, which happens to be the same, but implementing the Fix Caledon theorem just gives you a hypercular structure on the neighborhood of the zero section, which is not the identity section in this case. But there's a complete hypercular metric coming from a moduli space of solutions to Nam's equations, which is a reduction of the self joining in these equations. So there's also a happy kilometer to this case. And what's interesting is that the proofs um, of all these cases are completely different. So in the first instance, the fixed and Kalman theorem uses Twister theory. In the second case, uh, so this is Yao's theorem that proves it. And in the last case, as I said, it's a, it's a moduli space in which to read. So uh, that makes the conjecture uh, non trivial. And what I want to explain to this partial progress uh, on that uh, conjecture. Namely that um, if X is compact killer, we at least have a hypercomplex structure. With HC. So that means that we don't have a metric. Yet, but we have three integrable complex structures, i, j, and k, which behave like the quaternions, or i, the quaternion identities are satisfied. Uh, so that's near, near x, um, sorry, uh, g as a hyper complex structure near x, x embedded identity section. And further, so this is something special happening in dimension, real dimension four or complex dimension two. So if um, X has complex dimension two, which is the lowest non-trivial dimension possible, there are lots of interesting um, holomorphic Poisson structure on complex manifold of dimension two. Then there, there is indeed uh, a compatible hyperkiller metric. Compatible with the hypercomplex structure. And the point is to um, reduce the problem to producing certain deformations on the compact killer manifold X, which will lift to the group right here. And the fact that X is compact killer, we can use uh, lots of tools such as Hodge theory to, to prove uh, existence of these um, deformations and showing that. Uh, Formal power series uh, converge to actual uh, integrations of um, actual deformations of complex structures. Okay, um, and the way to do this is to exploit 
correspondence between apicular geometry and twister theory. So we recall. And then, so that this is known. And then the, the new thing is to explain how to obtain these twister space using the formation theory of complex structures. So let me explain that first and then questions. Okay. Um, How does it work in dimension two? I will explain that. I mean, it's not a answer, but uh, basically it just happens that the differential equations that we have to solve can be solved explicitly in dimension two and then uh, get the equation. I will explain that. Uh, okay. okay. Um, so, first of all, let me explain uh, this. Suppose we have a hypercular manifold. And um, the idea of uh, Corresponding with twister theory is to try to encode all this data, even the metric, which is infinity, to encode this into purely holomorphic data on a, a different uh, complex manifold. And so, um, first of all, how to uh, encode the complex structures? So the complex structures uh, are easy to code. For all point X in the two sphere, we have a new complex structure, which I will denote by I sub X by taking linear combinations of these complex structures, I, J, K. So that's a new complex structure, which is integral. So the habicular manifold, in fact, has a, three, a two sphere of complex structures, one two sphere. And then you can uh, put all these structures into a single complex manifold. If you take Z to be the product of M and S2, you can endow this with a complex structure by defining to be uh, the complex structure at the point P, X for P in M and X. Here. by taking the complex structure by x evaluated at p and the standard complex structure on the two sphere. Evaluated at p. So that's uh, an integrable complex structure on this uh, space z. Such that the map to S2, the projection, is a holomorphic submersion. So, with that, we can recover the complex structures, namely, let's call this pi, the pre image of um, pre image of uh, any point X is a complex submanifold. Uh, of Z, which is isomorphic to M with the complex structure of IX. So we recover, we recover all the complex structures um, in this way. Now we want to encode also the metric, which apparently is a C infinity object. But um, it suffices to construct, uh, to recover any of the killer forms, because if you have a, a killer form in a complex structure, you can recover the matrix. Uh, this is not uh, yet holomorphic. If you want something holomorphic, what you do is take this particular linear combinations of the killer forms. So that's a complex two form, which is holomorphic symplectic. 
with respect to I zeta for zeta, a complex number viewed as subset of uh, CP1 identified with the two screen. So here this I zeta is the same as the I x with uh, S2 identified with CP1. So this is holomorphic symplectic. And the fact that it depends quadratically on zeta means that you can um, you can view this as a single um, section of some bundle, holomorphic bundle in Z. Sorry, omega xi is holomorphic symplectic on, on what manifold? Um, it's holomorphic. This is a two form on M. Mm -hmm. So it's a holomorphic symplectic structure on M with respect to the complex structure by X. And if you want to view this as an object uh, living on Z, that's a holomorphic section of the second exterior part power of kernel of the pi dual. And the quadratic dependence means that this is uh, listed by O2, the model O2 on CP1. So it makes sense as a section. Uh, so that's a that's a bundle over Z. Um, so that's uh, once you have that, you can recover the complex structures and the metric because if you know any of the omega i omega j omega k, you recover the metric. So that seems like we, we encoded everything, but not quite because uh, it remains to identify the points. Because if I just give you a complex manifold Z, which is a holomorphic submersion, and such a section. Although there's, even though there's a complex structure on each, um, you have a family of complex uh, manifolds parameterized by S2, there's no canonical way of identifying all these structures in the, to a single manifold. Uh, we have not encoded the points of them. And so if you want to put that, pull back all these complex structures into a single space in such a way that you have a particular structure, you need to encode, encode the points in some sense, in some way. And for that, so for point P in uh, M, there's a, a section of the twister space is P, which takes X P comma X. So that's a whole more big section, which is invariant Under a real structure, so a map, the map from Z to Z taking Px P minus X, it's invariant under this. That's a real structure, meaning anti holomorphic involution on the complex manifold. Um, and also, it has, it's, a, it's special in the sense that it's normal bundle is, sorry, the normal bundle of section is isomorphic to some direct sum of O ones on CP1. And such a thing, we call this uh, a twister, a real twister line. And the theorem is that this is theorem due to Etienne, Wyatt, Lindstrom, and Rosek. Is that all the stuff in red is sufficient? So it's enough data to construct a hyperkiller manifold. Namely, the set of real twister lines is a smooth manifold with um, uh, a hyperkiller metric coming from pulling back all these uh, complex structures to the set of real twister lines. And uh, okay, I will also talk about hyper complex structures where we only have IG and K without the metric. And the same story uh, works here. So if we don't have 
the metric G, but we have R, G, and K. Uh, and we don't have the metric. So this stuff here is irrelevant. And, but if we have this uh, still uh, invest the third point here, this is enough to construct a hypercomplex one. So three complex structures by GNQ. Any questions? Okay. Um, now, uh, let me explain the second point. Is that uh, maybe too low? Let's see this. So, um, now the link with deformation theory. So a complex structure, we call it I zero because we'll deform it. Um, so you can view this as a randomorphism of the tangent space from PM to PM. But also a complex structure can be as can be identified with the one zero part, that's the sub distribution in the complexified tangent bundle. That's the minus I eigenspace for the complex structure. And if you get, if you have a, a sub-bundle of the complexification, which is compatible with con conjugation, satisfying a non-degeneracy condition and integrable, you can recover the complex structure. And so a deformation of the complex structure, so a zeta for zeta, a small complex number parameter can be identified with the deformation of the zero one part. Let's call it zero one zeta, which you can construct by adding some component in the one zero direction. So here that's the identity map and five zeta will be a map from the zero one part of M to the one zero part, such that phi of zeta is zero, the phi of zero, zero. So not every uh, such map will uh, give you an actual deformations because uh, you have to satisfy integrality of that this uh, distribution is inductive, And so it has to satisfy a differential equation, uh, which is the more Cartan equation. So it's a differential equation for this function, uh, this map phi of zeta. And typically what you do is um, you extend this phi of zeta has a power series in zeta. Where phi of n are, are maps from 0, 1, n to 1, 0, m. And I'm starting at n is equal to 1 here because we want phi of 0 to recover the identity map. And so, um, in general, solving such an equation is not always possible. If you start with a given phi one, you want to try to find the other coefficients so that you solve this. But you can set up this as a recursive um, recursive equation. And sometimes you can solve all the higher order terms, but sometimes it's obstructed. So at some point you will have to stop because there's just no solution. But as we'll see, there are methods for uh, solving these equations.
So um, first question you can ask is if you have a happy complex manifold, um, then you have a deformation of complex structures. You have this uh, family of complex structure, which I call I zeta, which deforms uh, the complex structure I. So this is the the ix here, which I defined here, uh, combinations of ij and t, where zeta is viewed as uh, a point in the view of it. And this is deformation of i, so you can ask what is the corresponding solution to the more character equation. And it turns out to be um, very simple in this case. So it truncates after the first term, you just have <coughs> phi one, where this phi one is defined, is given by the complex structure J restricted to the new one part with respect to I. So since J and I anti-commutes, I one maps zero one to one zero. And so uh, you have this very simple solution to the more complex equation. And the goal is to try to find more general solution to the Moore-Cartan equation that will imply that we get a happy complex structure. And so one thing you can do is fix a complex manifold, M, and um, the complex submanifold, X. Complex with respect to the complex structure I, of half the dimension. So what we have uh, found in this bullet point is that if you have a hypercomplex structure IJK, at least near X, then you get, you get um, a solution more Cartan equation, phi of zeta, um, so in this case, we have just one term, but in general, solution to the more Cartan equations can have infinitely many terms, which, um, um, so we have this um, solution. And if moreover, we assume that x, so manifold of half the dimension is totally real with respect to G. So totally real means that it looks like Rn inside Cn, which uh, can also be written down more invariantly as Cn is Tx, direct sum G Tx. Then we have a solution to the more curtain equation such that the uh, um, one zero part of M is the one zero part of X plus pi one, the first term in the series expansion for this solution to the more of the equation of T um, zero one X. So we have this implication and the theorem is that um, is actually one to one correspondence, meaning that if you have a deformation of complex structures, which can be an infinite, uh, an infinite power series, maybe only defined for uh, a small complex number less than some epsilon, then you can construct a twister space to get a hyper complex structure. So um, that's a theorem, and let me just briefly explain the idea is using twister theory. So the main idea is that uh, we can define the uh, deformation space, M cross C. So I'm assuming here epsilon is equal to infinity. Uh, so the power series is defined for all, for all zeta just to simplify. We can define a complex manifold the same way we did for the twister space here, uh, where we put the complex structure I zeta at the point uh, P zeta. 
So that's a complex manifold. And the key point is that X cross S1 embed in this deformation space as a submanifold of half the dimension. It's not a complex submanifold, it's opposite. It's totally, totally real. So it looks like Rn inside Cn. And so we have analytic continuation. That's the key point. J, uh, the complex structure on M for that. Uh, uh, here M will have all the possible complex structures, like all the I zeta, well, the same as we did for the twisters. The structure at the point. Yeah. Will be totally real for structure. all complex structure or? Sorry? Totally real with respect to all complex structures. It's totally real with respect to this single complex structure defined by I zeta in the first factor at the point P zeta and the standard complex structure of the second factor. So it's, it's like the deformation space where the fibers are all the different complex structures we get in the deformation. So that's an equivalent way of saying that we have a deformation of complex structures is ready for the fibers to see and then all the fibers are the complex structures. Just a more uh, uh, way to, to, to say it using a more quantum equation. So it's totally real with respect to that family of complex structures, uh, at single complex structures, which captures all the complex structures. So we have analytic continuation. And so we can construct the real structure by taking the antipodal map on, on this totally real submanifold, which, ha which ha will have by analytic continuation, a unique uh, holomorphic extension from M cross C star to M cross G star. Well, in fact, just a neighborhood of F, X cross S1 and M cross C star, but just to simplify, uh, we'll have some tau, which is um, holomorphic. And in fact, we'll take it to be the unique anti-holomorphic extension. And then we can use it to build a twister space. So Z will be, M cross C glued with M cross C, this deformation space here with the opposite complex structure and that fibers to C, CP1 and give you, uh, give you a hyper, um, that gives you a, a twister space for a hyper complex structure. And there's a version for that um, for hyperkiller manifolds which is more or less a corollary of this, uh, of this theorem, is that if you have a holomorphic symplectic manifold and um, X a complex Lagrangian, And the deformation of the holomorphic symplectic structure. So we deform uh, zeta, so we deform I zero and omega zero. Then um, the pullback of this family of complex structures as zeta, the first term, um, the zero of the term will vanish since uh, it's Lagrangian. So we'll have those higher order terms where these omega i's are just two forms of x. And if omega one is non-degenerate, we get a hyper-complex structure. And if moreover omega one is scalar, and we can kill the higher order terms, then we get a compatible hypercular metric G. So here is just a restriction of the higher order terms to X, which have to vanish, but the, the deformation uh, omega zeta can be. So um, for example, if we take M to be the cotangent bundle of a killer manifold, here omega is the killer form, then we can take 
as a deformation omega zeta is the canonical homomorphic symplectic structure of the potential bundle plus plus zeta times the pullback of the Kähler form. That's a family of homomorphic symplectic structures satisfying this condition. And we recover in this uh, way the fix and calendar theorem. So now let's go back to Poisson geometry and try to apply that um, to the symplectic group of it. So let's take X by sigma uh, holomorphic Poisson manifold, and we'll also assume it's compact and clear. So in this case, um, the sigma here is the holomorphic Poisson structure. I define it as a bracket, but we, we can also see it as a map from the cotangent bundle, the tangent bundle, which takes the uh, form DF and maps it to um, the vector, um, the derivation uh, defined by, by the Poisson bracket. And let's let's g omega be its integration. That's a holomorphic symplectic groupoid. Integrating it uh, this x. Okay, so this um, this sigma can also be viewed. It's a map. You can view it. It's a holomorphic Poisson structure, so you can view. It as a map from the T10 cotangent bundle to the T10 cotangent bundle. And as such, it finds a map from um, one one forms on X to zero one forms valued in the one zero tangent bundle by contraction. But this is exactly the space in which uh, solution to the more Cartan equations for the formation of complex structures can live. So let's call this phi. And so you may ask, given a homomorphic Poisson structure, what kind of um, what kind of differential equation does a one-one form on X has to satisfy so that the image under this map is a solution to the more Cartan equation? And it has a very similar form. And express it as d omega plus delta. This expression, the precise formula is not too important. So there is a differential equation, which has kind of a more Cartan flavor, which implies that its image by this, uh, the Poisson structure will be a solution to the more Cartan equation. And that was observed by uh, Hitchin. Which not only observed this, but it shows the amazing fact that, unlike the general Morris function equation, this equation is unobstructed, meaning that for any given omega one, we can expand the power series and solve this equation, and the power series will solve it, uh, will have a solution, and the power series will converge as well. So it's equal to zero. Uh, yes, thank you. So uh, this equation is. Unobstructed, meaning that for all omega one uh, closed one one form, there exist omega two, omega three, and so on, such that the power series theta n omega n solves it. Defining the deformation of the complex structure, and so the, the non-triviality—why, why magically everything seems to be unobstructed 
is because the Poisson structure is satisfies an integrability condition, which is the Jacobi identity. It has a as a Lie bracket on the space of orthogonal equations, which is an integrality condition implying that this is uh, strong. Um, so the idea is to um, is to try to lift these deformations to the groupoid. So you start with uh, omega one a killer form. On X and um, lift the deformation um, maybe I don't have much time to explain explicitly how to define this lift but there is a if you take the holomorphic symplectic structure like a zero on this G when you take the source map, the target map, you can pull back a uh, certain two form of zeta, which has an expression depending on this omega of zeta. And that will be holomorphic symplectic. So defining a deformation of holomorphic symplectic structures. And we wanted to satisfy the conditions of the theorem giving a hypercube structure. Which has to do with the pullback of this form. So we have to compute the pullback. Well, this omega zero here will vanish when we take the pullback because the identity section is Lagrangian. And uh, the source and target maps, oh, sorry, this one, this was a target. The identity section is a section of the source and target maps. So what we get is simply the difference between beta of zeta and minus beta of minus zeta. And that happens to be just zeta omega one, the killer form, plus only higher order terms uh, other higher order terms we killed on the even higher order terms. And so uh, on coronary, we get, because omega one is not literate, it's a kinder form. So there is a hypercomplex structure. There X in G. Um, and if part of the solution is zero, so if we can kill these odd higher order terms, then there's a hyper, hyper killer metric. And so these turns out to be a combination of algebraic equations. This is equivalent requiring that is, um, Coefficients satisfy these equations. And we need to satisfy this uh, differential equation. So here we guys, uh, depending on consider. So to get a hypercalorie metric, we have to satisfy this differential equation subject to this algebraic constraints. And this can be done in, in um, dimension two by um, an explicit solution. So we can define this omega uh, n recursively using the green operator of the Laplacian associated with the metric the killer metric we started with. So there's an explicit recursive formula for this omega n, and by playing with the killer identities, so this omega n, which omega one is kind of, it's like the left set operator on omega, uh, omega n. 
uh, and then by playing with the killer identities, we have uh, we can swap it with the B and B bar star. And the, the, the fact is that this, this is zero, this is a zero two form. And so when we apply the left set operator, what we get, the left set operator is uh, wedging with the killer form, which is one one. And so we get the one three form. And there's no one three form on the context of dimension two. So omega one three is equal to zero if dimension of x is equal to three. So um, in particular, this has a solution in dimension two. And moreover, it's interesting because uh, these differential equations actually exist, have a solution in dimension two, but also they're unique. So it's a, there's an existence, a uniqueness theorem, prove uniqueness by a certain uh, self adjoint elliptic operator. Um, and so uh, you can play with lots of examples now. So that's the, the next uh, the next step. Um, there lot, there's a lot of examples of holomorphic Poisson manifolds of dimension two. Uh, so for example, if you take CP, CP2, the Poisson structure, that's X, the Poisson structure is equivalent to a cubic curve. In CP1, uh, up to scaling, the Poisson structure up to scaling, where the cubic curve specifies where it will be zero. So that's an elliptic curve. And so there's a there's a hypercular uh, now new hypercular structure associated with each such cubic curve, which uh, is worthwhile studying. And lots of other examples, for example, in the final um, surface, in the final manifold, um, is holomorphic Poisson manifold with killer structure. And so you can try to study them. And the main question now is to study complete completeness of this matrix, because if you can show that one of these matrix is complete, then there's a lot of uh, interesting things you can do, especially in mathematical physics. They're very much interested in new complete, complete hypercular matrix. And specifically for those holomorphic symplectic group rates, because that there's a link with uh, the so-called brain quantization of Coven Witten, where these, um, these, if you have a complete hypercular matrix, there will be uh, a well-defined category of so-called co-isotropic A brains on these holomorphic symplectic manifold, which will serve as a way to quantize um, this holomorphic. So that's uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff to do. Yeah. Find complete ones. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Can you say it? I, I didn't get the, the last step about the cross structure, the cubic. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you explain again? Or? Uh, so, in coordinates, very simple. In coordinates, the Poisson structure will be <coughs> by dx wedge d by dy, or some functions, mm -hmm. that's why. And if you want this to glue to a Poisson structure on CP2, this has to be uh, cubic. And um, that gives a one to one correspondence between cubic curves as zero solutions of this F and um, some structures. And how do you show that? So, you, this uniqueness? Uh, the uniqueness. Um, is is it clear? Or? It's, uh, it's not immediately obvious, but it's not too hard to explain. But well, a slightly large is slightly larger. It's unique, assuming uh, so. All, the solution happens to be that all the even terms are L exact. And there's a unique solution such that all the omega to N are L exact. And um, I'm not sure if I remember the details, but the main uh, the main key fact is that. Uh, on the surface, this is a self adjoint. Maybe it is an I that I'm So this is one one form, one one form. This is a two two form. Take the Hodge star, get the function. But that's only on the surface. On the surface, yes. So this is for dimension two. Uh, okay, in dimension two. What about higher dimension do you? 
Higher dimensions, we can prove uniqueness, but uh, there are examples where these equations don't have any solution. Like if you take, uh, I don't know any compact example, but I will not be surprised if there's a, a compact example. If you take SL2 dual, that's a little bit flat metric, that's an example where this, uh, this is three dimensional. There's no solution to the equation. But uniqueness can be proved also by uh, the key level. I have an elementary question. Sure. So I think there are uh, like topological obstructions to being Kähler uh, and like on fundamental groups and whatever it is. So being hyperkähler, I, I presume that, especially in the closed case, there are very strong topological constraints. Might be. I don't know if uh, this has been studied, uh, much, but uh, like, um, People that study compact hyperkähler manifolds, most of, most of the time they study simply connected ones. Um, boy. But there might be topological instructions. Uh, yeah, I think for K3, even you have that numbers in print, right? Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Yeah, in concrete, even. Okay. Uh, and what about the audience? Um, Internet, if you have any question, please feel free to ask. Okay, there is no extra question. Let's thank the speaker. <laughs> <laughs>